Well, good morning, church. I just want to give an extra shout out and encouragement to come to the Ironman dinner this Friday. Adam Butel is an excellent speaker, and I know all the youth are very excited to hear from him. Also, um, I wanted to give you a big thank you for just the encouragement that you all gave me this past Sunday. Everyone asked me, was I surprised? And the answer was yes. They said, even though we only sang two songs? Well, I thought it was short, but I lost count. So <laughs> that's why I'm a pastor, not an engineer. But uh, I'm slowly working my way uh, through the cards. Many of you have put a lot of time and effort into it, and to make sure I still can fit into my baseball hats, I only want to read a little at a time, a little at a time, but it was a great encouragement, and a couple things I learned. One, you guys have awesome handwriting. I mean, I kind of felt, I don't know, like a doctor or somebody else with bad penmanship when I looked at, no, just kidding, but uh, they're just beautiful, elegant notes, and um, one thing that really stood out is how much you love preaching and teaching and hearing the Word of God. And that was a really good reminder to me about how important this time is uh, for all of us. And so let me pray and we'll get started. Well, Father, we come before you just um, humbled by this opportunity to gather together and to hear your Word taught. Father, we're so thankful for the ministry of Luke who recorded the words of Jesus so that we can hear what he has to say to us. And I pray that we will be uh, deeply encouraged by the blessings he promises to those who follow him in faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a week and a half ago, I listened to um, an interesting podcast by a man by the name of Aaron Wren. He's kind of a church consultant who and cultural observer who wrote probably the most influential evangelical article of the year. And the article is entitled, The Three Worlds of Evangelical Christianity. And he breaks it down to three worlds, and I've, I've alluded to this before, but I want to just break it down for you once again. The first world that he talks about is the positive world of Christianity. This is pre-1994 where being a Christian was a social benefit. It was a good thing to be known as a God-fearing, church-going person. This was in the days when communism was the greatest existential threat to the U.S., and one of the hallmarks of communism is atheism. And so to push back on that, having a robust church and a robust Christianity was a political asset. So it's no wonder that after the fall of communism, say around 1994, there was a change in the way the world saw the West. This was neutral Christianity, where in positive Christianity, Christian morals was kind of like standard and assumed and accepted. In, in neutral Christianity, uh, Christianity was one of, of many ways of, of seeing this world. Uh, there was a real element of relativism here. Where relativism here, where if you want to be a Christian, good for you, just don't impose it on me. There's, there's other ways that we can coexist as a society. So being a Christian wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but it wasn't necessarily a positive thing. And in general, the Christian way of seeing the world, the Christian morality and ethic was still there. And then you move to negative world Christianity, where society... Specifically, elite society has a decidedly negative view of Christianity or convictional Christianity. Uh, Christian uh, morals and Christian ethics are seen as a detriment and a threat to the public good. Uh, their moral views are seen as antiquated and oppressive. And this often coincides with the legalization of gay marriage and really the broad public acceptance where uh, Christianity is seen as, as a threat to many people. For instance, um, the biblical sexual ethic is the cause of many youth suicides. Biblical uh, you know, Christian nationalism is, you know, whatever that means, right, is seen as a threat to democracy. Uh, promoting the value of life is a threat to women. 
believing the Bible makes you ignorant. And, and in this world, if you follow Jesus and you join a conservative church that takes the Bible seriously, uh, it's almost viewed as if you have just joined a cult. Does that make sense? I mean, that is kind of the world that, that we live in. And, and for those of you who grew up in, let's say, positive Christianity, it's almost like the ground is falling out from under us. Us, right? It's hard to know what to make of this, and we see the downward trajectory, and, and you look at the future, specifically the future for your children, and there's concerns. You might have a son or a daughter who wants to be a doctor, and, and you wonder, for him to get a medical license, for her to get a medical license, will she have to perform an abortion to get that? If your son wants to be admitted into the bar, your daughter wants to be admitted into the bar, and they choose not to use people's preferred pronouns, Will they be able to practice law? Can they work in the public educational system if they hold to, let's say, a, a biblical view of young earth creationism, right? There's all of these things where there is this fear that Christianity will be pushed to the margins, and we already see it happening in elite circles. And, and so this kind of begs kind of a bigger question, right? It used to be follow Christ and your life will get better. You'll have meaning, you'll have purpose, you'll have community. And in positive Christianity, that was often the selling point. And so what do you tell people now when they ask, why should I follow Jesus? You can't really say it'll make your life here better, can you? But you know what? There's nothing new under the sun. Where we are in Luke is Luke has just recruited his disciples. I'm sorry, Jesus has recruited his disciples. He has uh, announced his 12 apostles. And all of this was precipitated by a real turn against him. Now, he was a rock star in Israel at this time. Everyone was traveling for miles around because they wanted to hear about this guy who was uh, healing lepers who was casting out demons, and who had set the synagogue on fire with his teaching. But all of it began to change when one Sabbath day, when he was in the synagogue, he looks out and he sees a man with a withered hand. And the religious authorities at the time had these rules that you could do some medical care on the Sabbath if it meant saving a life. But this guy's life was not in danger. That Jesus would not be limited by arbitrary rules about what kind of mercy and good works he could do on the Sabbath. And so he heals the man. He stretches out his hand and he regains the use of it. And the Pharisees at the time look at him. They cry foul. And he, come, he confronts them on their ungracious, unmerciful, and unbiblical understanding of the Sabbath command. He silences them and in resentment they see, then they plot his murder. And it's no accident after they start plotting his murder and what they might do to him that he goes up to the mountain and he prays and God gives him a succession plan and points to the 12 disciples who will assume the work of the ministry once he passes on. And these disciples, whether they know it or not, are going to be ministering in hostile world Christianity. It's like negative Christianity, but a lot worse. All of them, with the exception of John, and we're subbing out Judas for his replacement, would die martyr's deaths. I think about one of the sons of Zebedee, James. We learn in Acts chapter 12 that Herod had him arrested and then brought him out of his prison cell, had him literally lay his head on the chopping block. And I often think... As the sword was about to rapidly descend and sever his head from his neck, he might have asked himself the question, why did I follow Jesus again if this is what I get? Why, why do you follow Jesus? Well, Jesus gives the answer. Starting in Luke chapter 6, we'll go through 6, 17 through 26. 
And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him, and he healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so the fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you. For so their fathers did to the false prophets. Why should you follow Jesus? Well, because you will be blessed. You will be blessed. You are blessed. While the world may curse you, God will bless you. See, when you look at this passage, what we see is a reversal, don't we? We see a reversal. Those who are poor are blessed where those who are rich are cursed. Those who are hungry are blessed, and those who are full are cursed. There's a a reversal that will take place. And Jesus, as the king, he, he is basically coming here, announcing his kingdom, and he will establish it by establishing disciples and purchasing them and changing them and transforming them. But as we are to pray in the Lord's Prayer, right, thy kingdom come. There will be a kingdom to come, and when this kingdom comes, there's going to be this grand reversal that will take place where all those who suffer the consequences of their faith, who lived in hostile world Christianity, will say, I'm really glad I did it. I'm blessed. And all those who rejected Christianity for the glory and the good that the world could offer them, They'll count themselves cursed. We don't see it now. But what Jesus is doing is fortifying these disciples who are about to face a hostile world that it will be worth it in the end because you will be blessed. And this is something that you embrace incidentally by faith, right? Faith that it will all be reversed. In fact, we see three reasons why you should follow Jesus. Number one, Jesus will reverse the curse. Jesus will reverse suffering, and Jesus will reverse indulgence. So let's look at this first point. Jesus will reverse the curse. Verse 17. And he came down with them, and he stood on a level. Now, this is the second descent that we see, right? Jesus goes up to the mountain to pray, and then he goes down to his disciples And he appoints a group of them to be 12 apostles. And then he goes down again to a a large crowd. And he gives a sermon that begins with these beatitudes, these blessed. You know, beatitude is Latin for blessed. And it ends with uh, the parable of building your house on the rock. And so naturally, when you see beatitudes and house on a rock, you might think of another famous sermon that Jesus gave, the Sermon on the Mount. And what a lot of people do is they they speculate that what we read in Luke chapter 6 is a condensed form of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I disagree with that for a couple of reasons. Number one, this sermon takes place on the plain. The Sermon on the Mount takes place on the mount. There are nine Beatitudes in Matthew. There are four here, and plus you have four complementary uh, complementary, uh, woes to go with it. You also see that the Sermon on the Mount had a major emphasis on the law of this new kingdom. It was almost like Jesus was giving the constitution of the kingdom that's to come, where this one, the whole theme is on reversal. 
Now, Jesus was an itinerant preacher, right? He preached many sermons, and so naturally there'd be some overlapping themes, but I think if we just take this at face value, this would be a separate sermon that needs to be understood separately. When you have it, say this is like a condensed version of the Sermon on the Mount, then it's almost like we have to use the Sermon on the Mount to understand what this says. Where it's better to just take this as an independent sermon that Jesus gave at a different time for a different purpose. And the whole theme of it is one of reversal. And you see this reversal as, as he ministers to these disciples. And he came down and he stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. This is, incidentally, an international crowd. Judea and Jerusalem, people were usually Jewish who resided in those regions. And then you go up north to Tyre and Sidon, which was largely Gentile. And so here is Jesus, this future king, who's talking to Gentiles and Jews. Isn't that interesting? That hostility, that division between the tribes and the races are all coming together in front of Jesus' teaching. Who came, verse 18, to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him, and he healed them all. Jesus is rolling back the curse. As people touched him, leprosy, fevers, cancer. They didn't have COVID at that time, but that would have been healed as well. All of that was being peeled back because this king was reversing the effects of the curse. Uh, and it shows that when Jesus reigns in his kingdom, there won't be disease. Demons who were tormenting their host were being sent away in the kingdom. The demonic will not dominate God's people. This is going to be a new kingdom that's going to reverse the curse. It will be paradise here on earth. Jesus is going to bring it to pass. And, and it's interesting how these miracles almost certify the certainty of what Jesus is about to say about this grand reversal that's going to take place. Jesus will reverse the curse, and he'll also reverse suffering. And he lifted up his, he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. Jesus looks at his disciples, those who are faithful followers of him. And he says, you are blessed. Now, these are Beatitudes, Latin for blessed. They're these short, pithy sayings that make declarations of blessedness. And blessedness is kind of an interesting word because it's used in kind of a different way today. Like you have the whole hashtag blessed thing on Instagram or Twitter, right, where you have somebody who's looking very fit on the beach, hashtag blessed, blessed, holding a grandbaby, I'm hashtag blessed. I'm on vacation in Hawaii, hashtag blessed, right? Happy, joyful, life's been really good. But blessed carries more of a sense of divine favor. Um, we might use the word lucky, like somebody is really lucky. Like Nathan is really lucky to have awesome parents, right? Just arbitrary name, don't know where that came from. <laughs> and you tell Nathan, man, I wish I had parents like your parents. They're, you are so lucky. But we know that there's no such thing as luck, right? Nathan never got to choose his parents. They were chosen for him. It's divine favor that he has the parents that he has. He is blessed. And so taking that... Jesus makes these declarations of who has divine favor, who is blessed. And, and, and these beatitudes don't tell you what you need to do to be blessed. It's making a declaration of those who are already blessed. He's talking to his disciples. These disciples, on account of their faith, have these blessings upon them that are there in seed form now but will really be evident in the future when there's that grand reversal. And it begins with, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. 
Blessed are the poor. Now, in Matthew, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. But you have to remember, it's a different sermon. Now, it is true that poverty is never seen as a blessing in Scripture, right? It's never seen as a blessing. Uh, sometimes poverty is a result of your own foolishness. If you read the Proverbs, it makes it very clear. You do these things. If you're lazy, you're going to be poor. You kind of get what you deserve, right? But there's another sense uh, of poverty that I think is um, more of what Jesus is talking about in this passage. Now, do you guys remember the first sermon that Jesus gave? He's in the synagogue in his hometown. He opens his mouth. And he quotes this passage from Isaiah. He's, I'm going to just quote Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Now, he's quoting from Isaiah 61, 1 through 2. And that's given at, a, at an interesting time in the history of Israel because... The people of Israel were taken captive by foreign invaders, right? They were ripped away from the promised land. They were living in a, in a society and a culture that does not understand them or embrace them. And if they wanted to, let's say, make it in that culture, all you had to do was compromise. But because they maintained their integrity, they were impoverished as a result. They were oppressed. They, they were marginalized. And so the idea of poverty is not so much um, a lacking of financial resources, so much as the experience of marginalization. You don't have to be poor to be marginalized. Like some of the most marginalized people in that society at that time were the tax collectors, right? They were rich, but they were treated with sustain. Which they were um, treated with disdain. Later on in that passage in Luke, he, he talks about uh, Naaman, who was a rich Syrian general who had leprosy. He was oppressed by the curse. But in general, you know, those who are, who are wealthy, who, who are rich, they're not marginalized. Everybody wants to be their friend. But those who are poor, they bring nothing to the table. They're just extra in society. Nobody notices them. Nobody cares about them. And Jesus calls them blessed. You see, when you, when you follow Christ, um, there will be a certain amount of impoverishment that you will experience, right? At the very least, generosity does impoverish you to a certain extent, right? As you look out for the needs of others. Um, there might be some impoverishment of social esteem and social capital, but in some places of the world, there truly is impoverishment that happens because you're faithful to Christ. I read an interesting article about this province in China where there was a new policy. If you wanted to receive the government stipend, you think welfare, food stamps, whatever they have in China, if you want to receive that in China, this is what you had to do. You had to take down your picture of Jesus and replace it with a picture of either Mao Zedong or Xi Jinping. If you did not do that, no stipend for you. So what do you do in that case? Why should a Christian keep the picture of Jesus? I'm not saying you have to have a picture of Jesus, but you get the message. Because they will be blessed in the end, for theirs is the kingdom of God. There, there's a better kingdom to come. You may lose out on financial resources now, but in the future you will have a rich inheritance. You'll inherit a world where there'll be no more hunger, right? Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Now, I know some of you teenage boys think that you've experienced real hunger. But the people in this audience knew what it meant to really experience hunger. And often, hunger is a means of oppression, over those who can't speak for themselves. In 1932 through 1933, Joseph Stalin wanted to modernize the Soviet Union. 
And to do so, he needed some money. And the only thing that they really had at the time that they could sell or export to get the money they needed was grain. And the best place to find grain was in the Ukraine. Well, naturally, some of the farmers didn't want the government taking their land. And so Stalin ordered them to be, well, sent to the gulag for re-education. And so without the benefit of farmers farming the land who really had expertise and know-how, the region of the Ukraine fell woefully short of their quotas. And so Stalin accused them of sabotage. And so he raised up a group of crop collectors who would make sure that these farmers would not steal from the state. And as a result, almost four million died of starvation. Now, within that body, I'm sure there are many faithful Christians there. And, and what Jesus would say is, blessed are you who are hungry because you will be satisfied. If the Lord sees your suffering. He sees your pain. And in the future, he's going to come back and reverse it. You will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. And suffering is not fun, right? It's full of heartache. I think about John and what he must have felt when he watched his own brother get beheaded. But when the reversal comes, he shall laugh again. He shall find joy. And then verse 22, and this really helps you understand where he's going with this whole message. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. All of this talks about being excluded and being marginalized, right? People will hate you. They'll exclude you, revile you. They'll spurn your name as evil, not because of anything you have done, but because of what you stand for. Now, this past week, I, I peeked on the Drudge Report, just kind of checking on election news and stuff. It's kind of a hobby of mine. And I saw a headline that read, Carrie Lake, if you know who Carrie Lake is, she's a gubernatorial candidate for Arizona, a Republican conservative. But Carrie Lake airs an ad featuring a homophobic pastor. I thought, well, I can't resist this one. Who's the nutcase on the campaign commercial? And so I click on it, and I thought, wait a second. I know that guy. It's Justin Erickson. He was a pastor with me at my old church, went to seminary with me. He spoke at the first men's conference here. And somebody did their research found out that he's this radical right-wing pastor because he has things like this on his church's website. We affirm the headship of the husband and the submission of the wife. And then the commentary is, this church describes this view as central to its beliefs. Only men, according to the church's website, are allowed to be elders in Erickson's Desert Bible Church. It's like, wow. Wow. Remind me not to film a campaign commercial, right? But naturally, I mean, he's homophobic for calling homosexuality a sin. Islamic phobic for calling Islam a false religion. I mean, that's all that it takes, right? But this is negative world Christianity. Now, you have to remember, Jesus lived in hostile world Christianity, he says before he's about to go to the cross in Luke, or sorry, in John 16, 2 through 3, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. Right? There is an understanding in Israel. And that if we are going to get our country back, there needs to be a revival. And there needs to be a revival of the Jewish religion. And if everyone follows after Jesus Christ, this false teacher, this false prophet, God will curse our nation. Therefore, for the good of everybody, to save the nation, we need to get rid of Jesus. And then we need to get rid of those who are following him. 
and there was a campaign where people believed that by martyring Christians, by executing Christians, they did the whole world a favor, right? That's scary stuff. Jesus is not the only one who, who teaches this. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, right? It doesn't matter how nice you are. I mean, no one was more winsome and gracious and kind than Jesus Christ. And what happened to him? Don't think that you'll escape this if you live a godly life. But this persecution is qualified, right? It's done on account of the Son of Man. On account of the Son of Man. Not because of other things that you're doing in the name of Christ. I watched um, kind of a clever, good-natured Christian satire called The Gospel Blimp. You guys ever heard of The Gospel Blimp? Came out in like 1967, based off of a short story. But the plot is this. There's a group of neighbors who sit around, and they notice that they have two non-Christian neighbors next to them who don't go to church and occasionally uh, whip out beers when they barbecue. So not a Christian, and how do we reach those neighbors across the yard? And so they decide what we need to do is buy a blimp. And with this blimp, we can drag scripture verses over the city, and then we can drop gospel tracts, they call them gospel bombs, on the neighbor's yards. And then they decide that we are going to blare loud Christian music, including, and this is an all-time Christian classic, I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, right? I'm sorry I put that song in your head. But when they blare that, a columnist says, we've had enough of this gospel blimp and their loud music, and basically goes on a well-deserved rant, and the Christians cry, we're being persecuted. Now, are they being persecuted for Christ? Mm, yeah, not, not necessarily, right? If you're going to be persecuted, you need to be persecuted about sharing the right message in the right way. Sharing the truth. And that's all it'll take. But when that day comes, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Uh, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. Now, this is a countercultural response, isn't it? Because often when you speak about persecution, it's met with anxiety and it's met with fear, isn't it? The pagan boogeyman is out to get you. Children, be careful. They want you. But Jesus says, don't be anxious. Rage, this is unfair. Say this is terrible. He says, rejoice and be glad. Because you're basically numbered among the prophets. Isaiah Ezekiel, Jeremiah, you go down the line, all of them have suffered greatly. And yet for the joy set before them, they maintained a faithful gospel witness. In fact, one of the great passages I go to is Philippians chapter 1, where Paul says in, sorry, in verse 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. You know, when Christians face persecution with joy and hope, that causes those who persecute them to think, one, this is not working. Why is this not working? They must know something I do not know, and that frightens them. You see, your faith that there will be a reversal, that actually we're going to be on the right side of history, is a cause of joy that God counted you worthy to suffer, that you can join in the fellowship of Jesus and the fellowship of the prophets. Right? That's, that's why we follow Jesus, is for the payoff. But then Jesus reverses this. He 
he reverses the indulgences. Uh, he says in verse 24, But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. We have four sets of woes that are the opposite of the blessings. And, and it's as if Jesus is saying this. If following me is too hard, if these blessings don't seem worth it, you ought to consider some of these woes. Those of you who sell out, who join the world, may have some pleasure now, but you will be met with woe later, beginning with, woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. You know, as we kind of track wealth throughout the Gospel of Luke, we, we see that it is a huge hindrance to someone's spiritual life. Jesus talks about the rich fool who builds bigger barns and is taken that very night. You have the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember, you have this rich, wealthy man and his poor beggar who lived in front of his home. They both die, and they go to uh, the afterlife where the rich man is in agony in the flame, and the poor man is by Abraham's bosom. And the rich man has a conversation with Abraham. He expresses that he's in torment, and he says, can you have that poor guy fetch me some water? Even in hell, there's a sense of self-entitlement. You have the rich young ruler who had many possessions. And he says, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, sell all that you have and give to the poor. Basically, stop coveting. And the rich man couldn't do it. The Pharisees, they're singled out as lovers of money in Luke 6.14. Incidentally, the one rich person who seems to get it is Zacchaeus, who recognizes how he's been defrauding people and he generously parts with his money. All this to say, there is a danger with wealth because it can, it can become a substitute God. In Proverbs 3, 8, the author says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord, or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Now note, when there is a presence of wealth, and we know elsewhere that there are rich people who will inherit the kingdom of God, Paul says very clearly in 2 Timothy that the rich are to be generous, but when wealth becomes your identity, then the saying is true in Luke 18, 25, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. If you have the belief that you don't need the Lord and that you are better than other people, if you believe that wealth is proof of your greatness and a source of self-exaltation, woe to you. I actually read an article on why rich people think they are better than everyone else. They actually did studies on it. And this is what they said. People born into higher social classes are more overconfident and have an exaggerated belief that they will perform better at certain tasks than others. In contrast, working class people are taught to embrace humility and the importance of knowing your place in the social hierarchy. Isn't that interesting? Over and over and over again, there are calls for the wealthy to humble themselves. Otherwise, you will be humbled. Right? It's a warning. Don't allow the allure of wealth to pull you away from Christ. Woe to you who are full now, verse 25, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Living in locks up with the world might give you a full belly and, and a place at the table, the ability to laugh, to go to those parties. But in the end, they'll be met with hunger and, and, and weeping. And then verse 26, woe to you when people speak well of you, for so the fathers did to the false prophets. There is a temptation 
when you have a preaching ministry, a speaking ministry, a prophetic ministry, to tell people what they want to hear. I'm tired of these prophets who prophesy doom and gloom and judgment. Give me some good news for a change. In the Old Testament, you're going to win, king. Don't worry about it. That guy's out to lunch. Thank you. Feed that guy, by the way. We need more prophets like him. That's how it worked. And in this day and age, there, there is tremendous social pressure that you don't want to be known as one of those Christians, right? Right? You don't want to be known as one of those Christians. And to distance yourself, you become a critic of evangelical Christianity claiming to be one of the tribe. And this often shows itself in a very predictable pattern when it comes to LGBTQ issues. You have what we call gay-affirming churches. And this is the usual path. Somebody who's very outspoken, you don't need to ask for their opinions about different issues in society, you just have to poke them and they'll say it. All of a sudden, they are very silent about this issue. They don't condemn it, they don't affirm it, they don't really say anything about it. The next step is, I'm taking some time to pray about this and search the scriptures because this is really a complex issue. Right, So I'm just trying to give space to this. The next step is a call for compassion, that we need to be more known by our compassion than by our doctrine. Uh, we need to see them as human beings and care for them and embrace them, because that's what Jesus would do. Then this compassion is extended to people on the other side of the issue. You know, there's two sides of this issue, and And there's good people on both sides. I I think I'm still over here, though, but there's good people on both sides. And then there's a declaration of, you know what, I still respect the traditional view of marriage, but I think, you know, Jesus is just calling me over here. And then it's followed by a denouncement that I'm not one of those Christians. They get it all wrong. And they're gay affirming. And so what's going to happen is they will be met with the applause of the world. We're we're glad that you're not one of those kinds of Christians. We need more Christians like you. You might get on Huffington Post as, you know, pastor breaks away from the former bondage of his biblical understanding. But in the end, well... Woe to you when people speak well of you, for so the fathers did the prophets, false prophets, and what's the fate? If you seek the fame of the world and the acclaim of the world, you get the destiny of the world. 1 John 2, 15 through 18. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of the Lord, will of God abides forever. Do you believe this? This world is disposable. And if you hitch your wagon to this world, you will perish with this world. So what keeps you from doing it? Well, it's faith in this reversal, right? This world wants to tell you that you're crazy. This world wants to tell you that you're out to lunch. The world wants to tell you that you are on the wrong side of history. But Jesus says, blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. In 1965, Graham Staines graduated from medical school in Australia. He visited eastern India for the first time and had a life-changing experience as he encountered a, a leprosy home. It gave him purpose for his life, Instead of returning to Australia to begin 
a lucrative career in medicine, he moved to India to the leprosy home to treat the most marginalized in society. Over the years, he, he ministered. He finally met his future wife. They got married, had two boys. They became fluent in the language, and their care for the lepers made them pillars in the community, admired by all on the account of their service and their sacrifice and genuine care and compassion for those whose society neglected. He also lifted up the cross of Christ to the tribal region. He learned their language fluently and actually translated the Bible into their language. He actually had a very fruitful ministry where many of these people in the surrounding area were coming to Christ. And that's a problem in India, which was heavily structured around people's religious beliefs and classification. It's okay for you to believe certain things, but changing your belief destabilizes society. And as a result of many of the converts who did not want to live under that oppressive system anymore, Grand Stains became an enemy to certain violent people. On the night of January 22nd, 1999, Graham Staines and his two boys, Philip, age 10, and Timothy, age 6, were en route to a jungle camp. It was late, when it was no longer safe to drive. They parked in front of a church, laid the seat down at the back of their station wagon, got out their sleeping bags, prayed, went to bed for the night. And around midnight, a group of about 50 people, according to witnesses, showed up with pitchforks, axes, and other implements, um, shattered their windows, stabbed them with pitchforks. They tried to get out, but they were pushed back in. The crowd began to put hay underneath the station wagon, doused it with gasoline, and lit it on fire. The next day, they found Graham Stain's charred body holding his two boys. And you think about it. In that moment, when the flames are being lit, would you rather be Graham Stains or would you rather be the people lighting the hay and the car on fire? Who is blessed in that moment? Who is blessed is the one who enters the kingdom of God, who by faith believe that Jesus is the Messiah sent by God to deliver them from all evil, who died on the cross to pay the penalty for his sin, who was raised from the dead and defeated death and sin so that all those who believe in him can have an eternal kingdom. Why follow Jesus? You don't follow Jesus because you want a promotion or a stable family. You don't follow Jesus so you can get your best life now. You follow Jesus because there's a kingdom that's coming. And within this kingdom is a king who loves you and died for you and lives. Why follow Jesus? Well, ultimately because Jesus is the king and Jesus is worth it. And no one on that day who follows Jesus will ever regret it. Blessed is he or she who follows Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come before you as a redeemed people who wait for a coming kingdom. Lord, as we see um, the state of this world, I pray that we'll look at it through the eyes of faith, that we won't tremble, that we won't be fearful, that we'll know that you will win in the end, and that you will give us a quiet confidence to do the work that you called us to do, unafraid, unanxious, undeterred by those who seek to marginalize us. I pray that you'll give us a supernatural love for them, that in the midst of any suffering or pain or marginalization that they might inflict, we will love them through that, and that we will seek to demonstrate what it means to be kingdom people waiting for the kingdom of God. Lord, I pray for anyone who's on the fence about following Jesus, anyone who 
who is waffling, that this message will strengthen their resolve, that they will want to be numbered with Jesus Christ who was, well, outside the camp, that we'll all look to the better kingdom and anticipate that great day when you come back for us. In Christ's name.